lecture series for uh, all of us fun healthcare providers teaching each other wonderful things. Uh, tonight we'll have Tyler McGrath talking about TEG, thromboelastography, uh, and the severely injured bleeding patient. Uh, yeah, I'll just let him kick it off. Thanks for coming. Thanks for the intro, Jacob. Uh, everybody hearing me okay out there? Sound working? Okay, good. Um, so as Jacob said, I'm Tyler McGrath. I'm a nurse in the surgical intensive care unit at Denver Health, uh, level one trauma hospital. I've been there for 11 years. I um, also do some research through University of Denver, um, Anschutz campus, working on treating pulmonary injury associated with sulfur mustard inhalation. Um, I've been doing this lecture for about three years in our trauma and critical care course that's uh, put on by the surgical ICU. We try to do, we try to do it quarterly, but uh, sometimes it doesn't always work out that way. Um, and uh, generally our trauma and critical care course is designed for new SICU nurses, but hopefully this can provide some value to uh, each of you, um, regardless of where you happen to work. Um, so I want to thank you for joining me and us and uh, Denver Health Workers United in our new You Teach Yourself lecture series. Um, I want you all to know this is definitely an informal open discussion format. Um, I've got a beer open. If you don't have one yet, go make a cocktail real quick. And there you go. I like it, Peter. Um, so anyway, please stop me with any questions you may have. Um, um, we'd all appreciate it if you would uh, be on mute during the lecture, but uh, anytime you have a question or need something clarified, just pop yourself off of mute. Feel free to interrupt me. I'm totally fine with that. Um, the mute button, I believe, is in the top right corner of your, of your window there. Um, I'm used to doing this lecture in an open classroom setting, and uh, people definitely speak up and feel free to kind of jump up. In this setting, it's going to be a little bit challenging for me to see everybody in hand. So again, feel free to just interrupt and uh, speak up if you have a question. Um, so with that said, <clears throat> I'd like to know a little bit more about who all is joining us tonight. I know we've got some paramedics out there. I see some nurses, some uh, healthcare techs. Um, looks like a physical therapist, uh, yeah. pharmacist. Um, who else is joining us? It looks like that's about it. There's a Jackie, which actually may be my mom. She's a retired ICU nurse who's joining us from California, if that's who that is. So with that said, we're going to go ahead and um, get started here. Um, <clears throat> so welcome to my tech talk. Uh, we're talking about severely injured bleeding patients here. <clears throat> I'm gonna... So uh, what we'll discuss tonight um, is hemorrhage and hemostasis. We'll talk about uh, trauma-induced coagulopathy. Uh, we'll talk about uh, massive transfusion protocols specific to Denver Health and otherwise thromboelastography or TEG. Uh, the significance of TEG parameters and their related necessary blood products needed for hemostasis, and then we'll go through some case studies as well. So to start this out, we classify hemorrhage in a few different ways, capillary, venous, and arterial. Uh, to be clear, this specific talk is for severely injured bleeding patients. Um, we're not talking about small little bleeds that... Uh, you know, may require uh, even a unit or two, but we're talking about um, significant blood losses. <clears throat> so, um, an example of that is this picture here of a young man who was a victim in a driver in a was a driver of a rollover MBC with his arm, um, his left arm sticking out the driver's window, just driving along, and ended up having uh, rolling his his vehicle. So this kind of bleeding obviously has a lot of arterial blood loss, also venous and capillary. This patient probably required a tourniquet at some point. 
Um, <clears throat> furthermore, probably a pressure dressing for venous oozing until, um, until he was able to get into the operating room. Um, another, uh, another type of patient we're discussing here is uh, this kind of patient. This is status post motorcycle crash with a, with a tib fib fracture, a pretty severe one as you can see. Also arterial in nature, you can already see some compartment swelling in this x-ray. Um, of course, this is after he got external fixated, but uh, nonetheless, uh, you can see what kind of blood loss we're talking about. <clears throat> also, uh, a stab wound, a self-inflicted stab wound, uh, nonetheless. Um, this patient was actually fortunate enough not to have been arterial, although a very serious injury it was venous in nature, so actually didn't require too much blood product. Um, required a, a, about 24 hours in the ICU post-op just for close monitoring, but ended up getting discharged to the psychiatric unit pretty quickly thereafter. One of my favorite ones is this picture. It's probably really hard to see. It is even on my end. It's just uh, the quality of the picture I had to deal with. But uh, this was a skier versus tree who initially uh, presented with some rib fractures. Uh, this is the right side of his, his chest, left as you look at it, and this is the left side. He's got uh, one good lung to uh, ventilate and oxygenate with. And then the right side here, you can see all these rib fractures. Uh, you probably don't need to be a, a trained radiologist to see that there's a problem here. But um, rib fractures obviously cause some bleeding, both intracostally and uh, otherwise. I can't remember specifically. I think he had a, ended up with a diaphragmatic bleed. Um, that needed repair. But over the course of my 12-hour shift with this patient, um, I don't remember the specific number, but he got over, well over 70 units of blood product, went to the OR twice and IR once all on my shift, which was pretty exciting. He, uh, he came back about a couple weeks later to uh, thank me and the team and uh, ended up getting a $25 gift certificate to REI from him and a thank you card. So that was pretty cool. Uh, <clears throat> so Goals in the acute phase of treating these severely injured bleeding patients. So number one, hemorrhage control, obviously, right? You got to stop the bleeding, whether it's tourniquet or pressure or a, a pressure bandage, whatever it may be. After that is done, we can go on to hemostatic resuscitation. So restoration of normal blood clotting and replacing blood loss to maintain an adequate blood pressure. 40% um, of all trauma-related deaths are because of hemorrhage. It's pretty high. So it basically means we didn't accomplish our goals of controlling the hemorrhage or providing hemostatic resuscitation. Um, we basically uh, don't, you know, the point here is don't let your patient add to this statistic. So how do we do that? Assuming we've achieved hemorrhagic control, uh, restoration of normal coagulation. These uh, are patients where your actions matter and you can save a life. How do we do it? Well, we've got to stop the ongoing bleeding that's still occurring. <clears throat> we achieve that through hemostasis. Uh, this means the, it's the physiologic cessation of bleeding by correcting the coagulopathy. Okay, sounds pretty simple, but how do we do it? What do we need? And you guys are all pretty familiar with this, but <clears throat> what we need is an expert team, not a team of experts. There's a big difference there. Uh, completing an ongoing survey of the patient and providing a meaningful, uh, providing meaningful interventions simultaneously. So these are all things to think about both uh, pre-hospital, uh, in the ED, the OR, the ICU, rapid response teams, whatever it may be, whatever, um, whatever kind of uh, team you work on. Um, I, like, I like this adage that uh, somebody taught me one time, which is that critical care is a concept, not a location. So just remember that critical care could be provided in any location. It's, it's a concept that uh, we use um, completing these meaningful interventions simultaneously. So let's take a trauma activation. Uh, well, before we get started, how's everybody doing? Everybody okay? Doing wonderful. Okay, right on. I'm going to keep it going then. So we'll take a trauma activation. What does the care of this patient look like? So we have a bicyclist versus a vehicle. Um, what we know about him so far is that there's a complaint of a severe right hip pain, and pale and cool, 
and heart rate's 128, blood pressure's 86 over PALP. So pre-hospital, uh, considering we have some paramedics with us, um, what, what does the care of this patient look like? What do you guys do pre-hospital for a patient like this without getting too detailed? Maybe uh, top three things to think about. So generally, uh, top three things to think about are always airway, breathing, and circulation. Uh, this man seems to have a palpable heart rate. His skin conditions are poor, which means circulation is a concern. He's also very tachycardic and hypotensive, uh, however, permissibly so. So likely for us, we would control his airway aggressively and start two large bore IVs with uh, fluids TKO probably because saline has been more and more just not shown to be helpful in large boluses in these patients. Yeah, exactly. Thanks, Jacob. That's, uh, that's perfect. That's what we um, <clears throat> require and expect of, of our pre-hospital team that's working diligently to figure out what the problem is and to give us a little bit of a heads up as we come into the hospital setting. So <clears throat> once this patient arrives into the emergency department, I don't think I had any ED nurses on, on there, uh, but basically uh, similar things are going to happen uh, where we're maybe going to start to get a little more information, maybe do some uh, imaging, whether it be x-rays, CAT scans. Uh, we'll likely um, consider a, a, a additional fluids. Uh, if this patient's still having terrible blood pressure, potentially even consider starting a massive transfusion protocol, those kinds of things. So, uh, Basically, to summarize what uh, Jacob said, pre-hospital, we've got immobilization, peripheral IVs, maybe some fluid, um, some pain meds, possibly. And we may even consider a pelvic binder at this point, considering um, this patient's blood pressure and uh, their um, explanation of where their pain's coming from. Um, again, in the ED, we're going to do another primary survey, as Jacob mentioned they would do in the field, uh, ABCDEs. Uh, so, in this setting, um, the primary survey, ABCD, airway, we're going to assume that's okay because there's no information that says otherwise. We're going to assume breathing's okay. So, circulation here seems to be the problem. Our patient's tacky at 128. They're hypotensive with a systolic of 86. Patient's looking shocky. Um, and basically, we want to control massive exsanguination at this point. So likely in the emergency department, they're going to do a FAST, which is um, a focused assessment with sonography and trauma, uh, and where they basically use ultrasound to look at the main organs in the abdomen and find out if there's any fluid collecting around them, which would uh, lead us to suspect uh, that there's some bleeding going on there. Um, if they didn't already have two large bore IVs, make sure we get those. We'll probably send some labs, a type and screen, and uh, most likely due to the patient's blood pressure, we're going to start some uh, warm to IV fluids. Um, likely they're going to get the big two we talked about, chest x-rays, pelvic x-rays. Again, consider a pelvic binder, a sheet. And then uh, what needs to happen next? We're going to anticipate this patient is either going to need to go to the operating room uh, if, if they have an ongoing need for uh, uh, finding a, a site of bleeding, um, or they're going to be admitted for ongoing uh, monitoring. So the first priority in, this, in caring for this patient would be to identify and control the bleeding. So if the bleeding tissue is not repaired, then the injured patient can't be saved. So we can certainly buy time with resuscitation to promote optimal conditions until definitive care is provided. Whether it's operative, non-operative, like interventional radiology, or even just the ICU setting for careful observation. I tell my new ICU nurses, these are the patients that if you're open for this trauma, you're open for a hit in the ICU setting, you want to stock this patient as closely as possible. Um, I mean, even our, our healthcare techs are accustomed to doing this so they can best anticipate what the needs might be of the patient once they get to the unit. <clears throat> There's a study done um, by Dr. Moore and Dr. Kashik back in the 80s, both Denver Health trauma surgeons, um, that uh, let's see, it was called major abdominal vascular trauma, a unified approach. It concluded that 89% of mortality was due to bleeding, half of which occurred after control of the major bleeding. So basically, this patient goes to the OR where maybe uh, they find a bleeder in the pelvis or interventional radiology, and they're able to put a coil in something that's bleeding. And then they come back to the ICU, 
and they continue to bleed. Uh, not necessarily from a big open exsanguinating wound, but uh, a slow and steady enough ooze to where they lose a lot of volume and uh, ultimately um, end up in this irreversible shock and eventually death. Uh, and the pathology for this is called trauma-induced coagulopathy or the bloody vicious cycle. Uh, we also refer to it as the lethal triad or the triad of death. Sounds pretty gruesome, I know, but it's kind of exciting. Um, but it involves acidosis, hypothermia, and coagulopathy. So those are the big three there. Um, this bloody vicious cycle perpetuates itself with every minute left untreated. Time is life and, is life and prompt diagnosis is needed for optimal management here. I had a question here, Tyler. Yes. So uh, pardon me if I don't know this too much. Uh, the blood product itself that's being given to these people, is it like chemically controlled? Is it pre-oxygenated? Is it pH balanced? Like what's the actual chemical substance of it besides just blood, does that actually contribute to any of these things? Well, uh, I assume you're talking about um, like what kind of fluid we're reusing to resuscitate patients. Is that, is that the question? Yeah, fluid or like the platelets or even the blood cells themselves. Do they, are they, are they pre-oxygenated? Like, can like they contribute to a hypoxemia when they come in? Like if the patient is already hypoxic, are they pH balanced? So like the patient's pH doesn't get thrown off by the addition of all these like large amounts of fluids like, yeah so um i will touch on this a bit in uh, a couple of slides from now how crystalloid is not a really good uh, uh resuscitative fluid and that it doesn't carry any oxygen um prbcs obviously um have oxygen carrying capacity but um they're not we don't pre-oxygenate them before we give them to you we give them to you and we expect as as they uh, circulate in your body, you're able to oxygenate themselves as you ventilate. Um, and then there's some other um, um, things we give uh, that certainly require, uh, would, would require a, probably a chemist or something, somebody smarter than me to be able to explain, uh, you know, how things like cryoprecipitate work. And I know we uh, were able to kind of break those things down from platelets and whatnot to, uh, to give to patients. Um, I might be better off to answer this question in a, in a couple of slides from now, Jacob, if you uh, allow me a, 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 little, a few more slides here. Definitely. Thank you. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> patients in hemorrhagic shock, uh, do you think they might be acidotic? Yeah, of course they are. So a pH of less than 7.25 significantly decreases enzymatic coagulation factor assembly and decreases the yield of thrombin generation. Uh, and then do you think a patient like this might be hypothermic? Of course, again, right? A core temperature of less than 34 degrees compromises coagulation factor, enzymatic activity, and platelet function. Now, it's a, it's a mouthful, but uh, basically, um, the colder they are, the less uh, the, uh, the less um, effective the platelets become. So what do we do? We remove clothing to expose uh, patients, resulting in huge losses of heat. Uh, we also administer cold and room temperature fluids, further cooling down a patient. So we're actually adding to this problem of trauma-induced coagulopathy at this time. So we'll talk, about, we'll talk more about how to handle coagulopathy in later slides, but basically what we want to do is prevent coagulopathy. <clears throat> so back to our trauma activation, right? In the ED, our exam here, this patient uh, had a FAST done. It was negative. There's no bleeding from organs, but the patient's still shocky and hypothermic, right? So they've still got a heart rate of 131. Blood pressure is now 73, which is not good. This patient's hands and feet are ice cold, right? So they're shunting blood uh, <clears throat> and most likely we found that there's a there's a a bleed within the pelvis for this patient so the plan that uh, our surgeons are telling us is that they're not going to take this patient to surgery but they but they've called in the interventional radiology team and they'll be here in 60 minutes so what do we do until definitive treatment right how do we manage this shock how do we correct their coagulopathy there's a heck of a lot we can do but let's start with the basics so we'll talk about crystalloid so crystalloid can certainly add some volume to the tank. It'll help correct some blood pressure problems, but it's pretty short-term response. 
It doesn't carry oxygen to the tissues as we uh, mentioned earlier. It's certainly not useful in preventing trauma-induced coagulopathy. It, it dilutes clotting factors and overall worsens coagulopathy. And then a big, big thing to know about crystalloid is that versus colloid, like blood products, for every liter of crystalloid we give, only about 400 milliliters goes where we want it. So more than half of that liter bag, 600 mLs, leaks from the capillaries and actually accounts for more edema. And that edema we see, you know, 24, 48 hours, hours later in our patients with swollen hands, swollen everything, right? Uh, swollen eyeballs if they have to be prone to like everything. And then what you're seeing on the outside or externally rather is also happening on the inside. So bowels become edematous. The brain is, becomes edematous. Uh, pulmonary, like uh, uh, the lungs, everything. So ultimately what we've learned is, is crystalloid, although it can be useful in certain instances, is certainly not a great way to replace volume on a severely injured bleeding patient. So what can we do instead? <clears throat> we can give some hemostatic blood products, such as PRBCs. They add volume as well as carry oxygen. Uh, volume in a bag of PRBCs now varies from 200 to 350 mLs or so. Uh, and a unit of PRBCs should increase your patient's hemoglobin by one uh, gram per deciliter and a hematocrit by 3%, in the absence, of course, of ongoing bleeding. So it's a great way to determine if your patient responded as you're giving bags of fluid or bags of PRBCs over and over. Um, we like to use our point of care hemoglobin, AKA our HemaQ, uh, certainly in the emergency department um, to determine whether or not we give a unit of blood and their hemoglobin has gone from 6.5 to 7.5 seems pretty uh, um, effective. <clears throat> what about other products? So thawed fresh frozen plasma is frozen within eight hours of it being collected and contains about 600 milligrams of fibrinogen, um, as well as functional quantities of all coagulation factors. Uh, one unit of volume of FFP is anywhere between 200 to 350 milliliters. And then of course we have platelets, about 300 milliliters per unit, and it increase, increases platelet count by about uh, 50,000. So, um, one thing to know though about platelets is that about 30% of our patients total platelet value is, is pooled in the spleen of a normal individual. So, you know, if you've got that patient with a spleen injury, it's something to keep in mind. And then remember that platelet counts are not actually reflective of platelet function. Bleeding from dysfunctional platelets may occur regardless of platelet count, especially in hemorrhagic shock. And then in addition to that, we have cryoprecipitate, right? So cryoprecipitate is from my understanding, obtained from precipitation of a unit of plasma. And then in, at Denver Health, it's delivered as a 10-pack in, in one bag. It gets kind of confusing as to uh, why they call it that and why they do that, but it contains roughly 200 milligrams of fibrinogen as well as other clotting factors. <clears throat> so the typical trauma patient, uh, well, this is kind of what a typical trauma patient uh, looks like in the first 12 to 24 hours in the surgical ICU. So what do we see here? Basically, you see a patient on a bed. Um, well, first thing I notice is that the patient's flat, right? We, I don't know yet if we've ruled out this patient's spine. So clearly this patient's got a collar on. They've got a uh, uh, TNL spine that we don't really know yet about. So we need to assume that there's an injury there. So they're going to be log roll and flat and in a, uh, a, a special uh, bed that can um, serve their needs there. There's a ventilator in the background. Obviously, it'll help us with some of the acidosis problems. Um, <clears throat> and then they're on all kinds of drips. We've got a monitor here, right? We've got a level one uh, warmer over here, um, which I remind you that you know we can use level one not necessarily as a rapid way to uh, infuse blood products or fluid, but also as a way to just warm fluids. Uh, <clears throat> So um, what the take home here is basically, you know, it's not just about the numbers. We often do get caught up in the ICU setting with our numbers, right? We've got a patient on the monitor and we follow these things very closely, but it's not just about heart rate, blood pressure, MAP. You know, it's really important to have a good thorough exam uh, and, and that we repeat that exam uh, frequently um, as we're still intervening on this patient's shock. 
So for instance, are the, exam are the extremities warm? Is the patient making urine? Or are they cool and pale and with poor urine output? So there's some other uh, interventions and medications we could also consider uh, in caring for this patient, such as uh, desmopressin, um, also vas vasopressin, DDAVP, which actually increases plasma coagulation factors. Uh, we'd consider reversal agents for any patient that we knew was on Coumadin therapy or some, uh, something along those lines. Um, TXA, transexemic acid, is something we'll discuss later. It's uh, pretty controversial, but can be useful in, in appropriate patients. Um, there, I know there are some institutions that still give uh, TXA empirically for severely injured bleeding uh, trauma patients. Denver Health certainly is not one of those uh, facilities, to my knowledge. Um, other things like factor seven, very, very expensive, thousands of dollars for a dose, super short half-life, kind of a last ditch effort when surgical bleeding um, uh, has been controlled. It's, we kind of use it for more like salvage therapy uh, situations or again, last ditch efforts. Um, other interventions, like I said, we've got the ventilator back there, the bear hugger to warm our patient, um, the level one. Um, we'd also use something like a flow track to uh, help um, determine a patient's fluid volume status and their need for ongoing fluid resuscitation. We're also going to draw some labs to help measure or see how our treatment's working. Um, we're going to send off a lactate, a, a ABG. A, we really want to know this patient's pH and their base deficit to kind of determine where they're at with their shock and acidosis. Uh, we're going to draw serial H and H and H's um, to, to monitor their hemorrhage. Um, we'll probably uh, end up monitoring this patient's calcium level pretty closely. It tends to get used up uh, by preservatives and blood components. Um, and then, of course, their coagulopathy. So in the past, we would send a blue top, which would be like a PT, INR, those kinds of things to kind of determine uh, um, how our patient's um, level of coagulation is, is going. By the way, is it important to uh, draw um, labs in a specific color? Um, I'll say, yes, it is. Uh, generally, we're drawing blue tops, green tops, and purples, and that's the order you want to draw those in. It's alphabetical, so pretty easy to remember. Uh, so the question is why? I'll show you this quick, short, little one-minute video about that, if I can get it to work. Nope, not going to work. That's all right. Um, I'll send it to you later if you're interested. But basically, you can have, there's citrate involved in these, um, in these tubes, and when you go from one to the other, little remnants of these citrates can also be just dumped into the next tube. So maybe a patient that's got a, a low potassium level might not show up because we've added a little bit of potassium to that tube. Oh, it is going to work. No, that's too long. All right, we're going to pass that. Okay, so what can we do? So we have massive transfusion protocols, uh, which we use when uh, the patient is too critical to delay treatment waiting for lab values to come back. So the patient is presumed to be circling the vortex of the bloody vicious cycle towards death and if intervention is delayed. So activation criteria for uh, uh, massive transfusion protocol, the methods of coagulation assessment and blood product ratios do vary widely between institutions, but studies demonstrate that survival between, uh, or sorry, survival uh, benefit with a RBC to FFP ratio between one to one and two to one uh, have the most benefit. But basically the goal here is early transfusion of plasma, RBCs, uh, and of course platelets and cryoprecipitate when you can get those. Basically what we're doing is we're replicating or mimicking uh, the walking blood bank of the military uh, and giving this patient whole blood back in the form of many different bags. So, uh, <clears throat> At Denver Health, massive transfusion protocol can be initiated by literally any employee in the hospital on any inpatient. So I can have my EVS worker or uh, my food service person uh, call the blood bank and initiate MTP uh, with the patient's information. <clears throat> Some criteria that uh, has to be met, and we're not gonna go over this with the uh, folks that work in the blood bank, but it's gonna be assumed. 
uh, but they have to have a systolic less than set less than or equal to 70 or a systolic less than or equal to 90 with a heart rate greater than 108. In addition to those, one of those things, they also have to have a penetrating torso injury, a major pelvic fracture, or a positive fast in at least one body region. <clears throat> so what do we get in a cooler? Our cooler shipment contains four PRBCs and two FFP. So we're, we're going off of the uh, two to one ratio here at Denver Health. It's type O positive until patient's blood type is confirmed, uh, after which it will then be type specific blood. And then additional coolers will pr be provided in the same way, four to two ratio, unless specific products are requested and if available. Those have to be requested. It's simple. Just call and say, hey, with my next shipment, I need a platelet or a, and or a cryo, et cetera. So what are the cons to MTP? Other than, of course, the paperwork, as you see here. Although I'd argue that this is a lot easier paperwork than the uh, electronic chart that we have to do nowadays. Well, <clears throat> excessive blood component administration can certainly be harmful. It'll, it can increase your risk of pneumonia, acute lung injury, uh, multi-organ failure, ARDS. Um, blood products are expensive and there's a limited supply. So we don't wanna just keep giving somebody uh, four and two all day long until uh, we run out of supply. One out of 100 uh, blood transfusions that we give end up with a fever or an allergic reaction. One out of 5,000 will end up in trolley, uh, which is a transfusion-related acute lung injury. And then, of course, you always have mistransfusions, uh, hemolytic reactions, bacterial contaminations, not to mention things like hepatitis and HIV uh, spread, which is super rare but can happen. But ARDS and, and transfusion-related circulatory overload being the most common that we'll have to deal with in the ICU setting. Pretty much every patient that gets MTP ends up with, with, the, with that problem. So how do we hit the target? How do we give a patient exactly what they need and not a drop more? Again, in the past, we would send things like uh, an INR, a PT, uh, an actual platelet count off of the uh, uh, CBC. We'd maybe send a fibrinogen, a D-dimer. The cons of this uh, monitoring or this, this testing is that it takes a lot of time to get a result. It's, it's also not a very accurate picture of the coagulation abnormality. So is there a better way? How do we give them exactly what they need and not a drop more to improve their chance of survival? The uh, goal-directed patient-specific blood component administration, well, the answer there is thromboelastography. So now we're getting to the, the juicy good stuff of our, of our uh, presentation here. So thromboelastography, or TEG as we call it, provides a real-time analysis of clotting, which represents both enzymatic and platelet contribution to, to clot formation. So TEG provides data on basically changes of whole blood as it clots. Uh, basically what happens, we send, we send a blue top to the lab and there's a technician that grabs it and uh, through some really smart and expensive uh, diagnostic um, measuring <laughs> ability uh, and, and a timer, they're able to basically start to see when a, plate, when a clot starts to form, uh, the strength of the clot, and then of course when the clot starts to break down. Um, <clears throat> in the old days, we'd have to call the lab, call the, uh, the lab tech, the, the special lab tech that was there specifically to run tags and they'd, they'd ha uh, get everything ready, all their citrates and everything, and then you could run it over within a few minutes. Um, nowadays, it's always on hand and always ready for us to run. We don't need to call the lab in, in advance. We just send the test and literally we can get, uh, we can start getting results um, within five minutes of them having that in their hands, which is really pretty fascinating. It's really the only true stat lab test that we have. I see there's some chats coming through. I want to make sure that there's uh, Yeah, Meg was just asking what the uh, specific range is you're looking for when you're using this machine in this test. Thanks, Megan. I will get to each of those specifically, uh, the ranges that we're looking for. Thanks for that. Um, <clears throat> and if I don't answer your question, please uh, feel free to re-ask re afterwards. So uh, 
thromboelastography, uh, yep, immediately getting results back um, within five minutes, true stat test. So TEG was developed actually uh, in like 1948 for uh, evaluating clotting factor deficiencies. It was used in the past for liver transplantation as well as monitoring patients on cardiopulmonary bypass. So Dr. Moore did a randomized study at Denver Health that compared rapid thromboelastography with conventional coagulation testing, such as your PTINR, fibrinogen, et cetera, for diagnosing post-injury coagulopathy and helping to guide hemostatic resuscitation in severely injured patients who were arriving at the trauma center and likely to require transfusion therapy. So Dr. Moore kind of uh, brought TEG to trauma. <clears throat> so specifically, what are we looking at? So TEG gives us parameters to correct coagulopathies and halt the bloody vicious cycle. Uh, the amplitude of the tracing on the y-axis here um, uh, represents the, the mechanical strength of the, of the forming clot plotted over time on the x-axis here. So the clot is evaluated in a dynamic way from earliest mechanical resistance provided by the first strands of fibrin to loss of strength secondary to fibrinolysis at the end here. Um, <clears throat> activated clotting time is going to be the time for coagulation factors to form the initial strands of fibrin. Uh, the maximum amplitude measurement of the size of the clot is determined by platelet bonding, basically. Um, and then the angle there, the rate of clot growth or the fibrin buildup. And then uh, <clears throat> fibrinolysis is the, we call it the LY30. It's lysis after 30 minutes, um, at which point we determine the percentage of that clot, uh, how much it's broken down. So let's look at that a little bit closer. So the activated clotting time, the ACT, this is the first number we get back generally within three to five minutes. And uh, it's the most common one that's out of whack when somebody has a coagulopathy. Um, the, the value here that we're looking for is uh, greater than 120 seconds. Or sorry, greater than 128 seconds. So meaning that normally in a healthy, non-bleeding, non-coagulopathic person, it would take less than 128 seconds for a, flop, for a clot to start to form. Okay, so this represents time. All right, as we're going along, that timer's ticking and the, uh, and the lab tech is in there watching this clot. Uh, basically, when it starts to form, uh, they look at the timer. And if it's, if it's taken greater than 128 seconds, it's too long. It's taking way too long for that clot to form. And so that is one of the reasons why this patient has a coagulopathy and is uh, not forming a very good clot. So anything greater than 128 seconds, we've determined that they need two units of FFP. That's what we'll do. Okay, again, we've got a severely injured bleeding patient that's requiring ongoing fluid resuscitation. We're going to send this tag, ACT greater than 128, we give two units of FFP, and we recheck a tag. And generally, if, if it has done what we want it to do, it'll correct that number, at least for a period of time. Um, <clears throat> I think we talked about uh, volumes of FFP and things like that. So we'll keep going. So that's the ACT. Next being the, this uh, maximum amplitude. So the MA is the strength of the clot as determined by the platelets. Okay, so it's literally the measurement of the size of the clot as determined by fibrin, excuse me, and platelet bonding. It represents platelet function uh, and contribution to clot formation. So less than 55 millimeters, again, they're like, somehow I've got this fancy testing over there where they're able to measure this stuff. But less than 55 millimeters basically means to us that this clot is not strong enough. It's breaking down way too easily. So in order to make it stronger, the blood product that they would need is platelets. Okay, so if we have an MA less than 55, we're gonna give this bleeding patient a unit of platelets. Same thing, we're gonna recheck a tag. <clears throat> um, the angle between the ACT and the MA is just that, the angle, okay? It's literally the degrees, ang angles at degrees, uh, and represents the rate of clot growth or fibrin buildup. Um, it represents fibrinogen or cryoprecipitate, 
in its contribution to clot formation. So less than 65 degrees, they're gonna get a 10 pack of cryoprecipitate, okay? That is what will uh, increase their uh, angle on this clot formation. And then finally, 30 minutes later, we look at this LY30, okay? So fibrinolysis, that's why they call it LY, lysis at 30 minutes. So it's the percentage of the clot breakdown 30 minutes after uh, the maximum amplitude, okay? So the critical value here would be 5%. So if the clot breaks down quickly, they're basically hyperfibrinolytic, and uh, we can improve that <clears throat> potentially uh, if we don't cause them more harm by giving them a gram of TXA or transoxemic acid. So what is that? So uh, transoxemic acid is an antifibrinolytic prevents fibrinolysis by binding to plasminogen, preventing its interaction with fibrin and activated uh, by TPA into plasmin. <clears throat> I mentioned to you before that this is super controversial and it still remains such, but it may be useful in appropriate patients. Um, we, at Denver Health, we use uh, empiric TXA when a tag is unavailable for whatever reason, and if a patient is at high risk of hyperfibrinolysis. Uh, be, being, being defined as basically severely injured with a systolic less than 75. Um, but generally, we're not going to do this outside of the time frame of about three hours from their onset of injury. So <clears throat> basically, we've determined that TXC, TXA can be useful in the setting of a trauma patient, of a bleeding trauma patient within three hours of injury, after which it's probably going to do more harm than good. Again, uh, a bit controversial there and not something certainly in the ICU setting that we'll, de that we'll deal with very much. Um, I know that there are certain places that are actually carrying uh, TXA in the field um, and then of course in the emergency department, uh, much more common to be given than in the ICU setting. So here's kind of the, uh, go ahead. I had a question. So when you order one of these uh, tests, do you receive a result like every two minutes, five minutes, 30 minutes, or is it just all at once later on? Uh, they, we get the tests in real time as they come in. So the first one that we'll see is that ACT. If it's uh, critical, we'll actually get a phone call from the lab tech saying, just like any other critical lab value, hey, you've got a critical lab. So again, within three to five minutes, I'm getting an ACT result. Uh, within five minutes, generally, I should have those first three things back. An ACT, an angle and an MA. It's gen it, if it's not five minutes, it's it's you know six or seven minutes uh, coming in real time. And then of course that LY thirty would be thirty minutes after the MA starts. Awesome, thank you. Also, have you noticed any uh, real changes if someone gets transoxemic acid outside of that window? If you've taken care of any people, do they have like crazy complications, or is it just kind of one of those things that it's hard to pin down empirically yeah, or anecdotally? I think that it's, it's definitely hard to pin down, you know, uh, trauma is an interesting thing to do research in because there's no controlled setting, right? It's just uh, real time uh, learning. And so um, as we do things to people and we see that it causes harm, we start to realize that that might not be the best treatment. It's just like, you know, in the old days when we would give leaders and leaders and leaders of crystalloid to people and realize that, uh, you know, they've got swollen bowel and, and uh, you know, died from coagulopathy and everything else. So <clears throat> uh, patients that we've seen that have gotten TXA, uh, in my recent um, remembering, um, they've done okay. They've received it. Uh, the one I'm thinking of most recently actually received it at an outside hospital and then was transported to Denver Health. Um, and they didn't end up having any odd um, uh, clot breakdown or anything like that, um, or, or uh, generally what would happen would be blood clots would form, right? So there's not enough, that clot is not breaking down at the right time um, or after enough time, and it, that clot just, just remains and lingers and stays out, stays hanging out. And then little pieces of it, of course, get into the bloodstream and we end up with, you know, PEs and uh, DVTs and all of those kinds of things. So those are certainly things that happen pretty regularly, unfortunately, but uh, again, something we're still studying and learning. 
Oh, thank you. So here's kind of our um, summary of our rapid tag treatment algorithm. You can see the values, um, the, uh, the values in which we will give the blood products and what blood products those are for each. So what are the benefits to TEG? Well, again, we've talked about the fact that it only takes about five minutes for an ACT to come back and a couple more for a few of the others. It's certainly much more comprehensive versus a PTT, INR, it's specific to the patient. You know, you have two patients that have bled the exact amount of blood with the exact same trauma, but they're gonna have different needs in regards to uh, their TEG-based resuscitation. Um, it's certainly uh, much, uh, much more specific to a patient versus typical MTP, massive transfusion protocol replacement ratios. Again, they may be getting more uh, blood product than necessary with MTP. Uh, and then we're all, we can also decrease complications secondary to blood transfusions um, and decrease fluid overload, and then ultimately help to halt the bloody vicious cycle. So this is interesting because uh, one of our surgeons told me that when he's operating on patients in the OR, uh, they've, they've got a uh, thromboelastogram uh, uh, machine, I guess, in the operating room. So basically they get a printout and these tracings show up. So without numbers, well, they do have numbers, but they basically are able to see the tracing from a distance. And they can tell from looking out the OR window, basically, uh, what their patient needs due to how their tracing level comes out on the, uh, the tracing map. So let's take a new, a new case study and apply what we've learned. So we've got a new trauma activation, multiple stab wounds to the abdomen, Heart rate's 133, systolic is uh, less than 90, meets our parameters as far as MTP goes, certainly. And then we also have a penetrating trauma to the torso. So what do we do pre-hospital? We're gonna do the same things uh, Jacob mentioned uh, in the previous patient um, with, uh, with um, IVs, maybe a little bit of fluid, maybe some pain medication um, and, and get them to the hospital pretty quick. In the emergency department, um, likely because of this patient's blood pressure, which was 85 uh, systolic, we're probably going to start this patient on MTP. Um, they're going to do a fast, which uh, is it's showing up here that we've got a positive fast, and that they're likely going to go need to go straight to the operating room because of that. So MTP was started uh, and appropriate, I think, due to the vital signs and the injury. So four PRBCs, two FFP come in a cooler. We're going to get those going probably through the level one pretty quickly uh, as they prepare an operating suite for this, for this patient. Um, so patient goes to the operating room. <clears throat> and we know based on this patient's uh, blood loss and injuries that they're likely going to need ongoing post-operative uh, monitoring closely in the ICU setting. So we're going to anticipate status post-operating room, they're going to come to the uh, surgical ICU. Um, and as the surgical ICU nurse, we get report from anesthesia, right, that is going to tell us kind of what they did in the operating room. They did an X-lap and they ultimately found that this patient had a, a liver lack and packed it, right? <clears throat> they're going to tell us uh, the I's and O's and, of course, the patient's vital signs. So did we get hemorrhage control in the operating room? That's kind of the underlying question. The, the surgeon thinks that we did, certainly. They've, they found what was bleeding and they packed it, basically created a, a tamponade to the, um, to the hemorrhage. But um, <clears throat> what interventions do we anticipate in the surgical ICU? Does anybody have any uh, thoughts about that? What, what would that look like as far as ongoing hemostatic resuscitations, vital signs, the exam? Well, I mean, I might so get I, some labs. You might get some labs. What kind of labs might you get? I would probably get a tag. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. So let's get a tag, right? Because if we find that this patient's ACT is, you know, 132, uh, most likely we're not going to do a real good job of hemostasis if we allow this patient's coagulopathy to continue to be an issue, right? 
what other things might we want to do for this patient in the ICU? I mean, judging by their vital signs, not much has changed. Uh, yeah. I also had the question, uh, you mentioned pain meds in this hypotensive patient. Have you noticed any real uh, impact on pain medication in the hypotensive patient? Like uh, I know certainly myself and many of the paramedics are hesitant in the critically injured bleeding patient to give too many pain meds because we're afraid of dropping their blood pressure too low. Certainly. No, I think that's a, a great point that you brought up. And we have the same um, uh, thought process in the ICU setting, right? So um, if our patient's hypotensive, uh, nobody wants to give them something that's going to make them even more hypotensive, whatever it may be. I think in the, I think my kind of point in uh, mentioning pain medication in this setting is to, is to kind of make your patient a little bit more cooperative if they're not cooperative with you in the field uh, or in the emergency department setting while you're trying to get tests, uh, imaging, and do things to your patient. Certainly, we're not going to always give pain medication. You know, if you've got a patient with a GCS of seven, uh, you know, you might not have a need to do that. Whereas if you've got a patient with a GCS of 15 who's in there screaming at you, you may want to provide some pain medication. Awesome, thank you. Um, so other things we might do. I, I thought I heard another voice there. Did somebody else want to chime in? Okay, so uh, how about this, this patient's uh, temperature, right? Temperature UTA, what does that mean? Unable to attain, right? Unable to assess. So this patient's so cold uh, due to fluid loss and likely uh, nobody having really paid too much attention to that until uh, they come to the ICU. So we want to use warm fluids. We want to get them off of their cold, wet, bloody bedding, linen, etc. Apply the bear hugger. We've got to correct that hypothermia, right, to keep them out of that uh, lethal triad of death. Um, <clears throat> we probably continue to resuscitate this patient with what kind of fluid? We've talked about this already with our with sending a tag. So specific to what this patient needs, right? We just want to give them what they need and not a drop more. Crystalloids are still probably not going to be real helpful uh, in this in, in the recovery of this patient. Um, um, but certainly the more PRBCs, FFP, platelets, and cryoprecipitate that we can get into this patient, the better off they'll be. Assuming that we have hemorrhage control from the operating room with the packed liver. Um, we're going to probably also, uh, you know, watch those lactates, ABGs, et cetera, and kind of see where we're at from that standpoint. That'll also help to better guide us. So basically, you mentioned it, TEG-based resuscitation, right? That's, that's what we've got to do. That's what we do uh, for this patient, for caring for this patient in the ICU setting, certainly. Um, we use rapid TEG to utilize goal-directed blood component administration, and we repeat the process until the patient's no longer coagulopathic. So we're going to repeat TEGs until they come back normal, all, all day long for 12 hours if we have to, and 70 units of blood product, and two trips to the operating room, and once to that interventional radiologist. So congratulations. You were awesome. You saved a life. And I want to say a quick thanks to uh, <clears throat> the old educator in our uh, surgical ICU, Nicole Burnett, who um, kind of encouraged me to teach this class a few years ago. Uh, Brendan Reese, who was a surgical ICU nurse, who's now a flight for life nurse, um, who used to teach this class prior to him moving on. Um, and I kind of inherited it from him. That uh, He's definitely been a mentor over my career. And then of course, Dr. Moore and Dr. Piracci, um, who's taught, taught me a lot about tech-based resuscitation uh, over the years. So I want to thank you all for your attention. Um, we've, you know, we were a few minutes away from eight o'clock. And again, I want to, wanted to be respectful of your time, and, uh, but certainly happy to answer any questions you may have either now or there's my email up there um, if you want to stay in touch or uh, ask any follow-up questions. Happy to um, keep this going for a little bit if you have anything else. I see Megan's uh, <clears throat> Megan's message on there. Consult physical therapy. You'll get his blood pressure up. I love it. It's so true. 
I'll anybody have any other follow-up questions i got a question on the case study one um you had mentioned like that for sake of argument or the example the act was 132 um, but you still hadn't gotten a temperature and there might have the patient might have been hypothermic um would you address those like hypothermic things before like going down the treatment algorithm of giving fresh frozen plasma before and then like reassess the tag and like try and make sure they're at like a good baseline or would you kind of do both at the same time yeah great question peter thanks for asking the, would the temperature be before the tag even at all yeah it um you know, it's not like an ABG, which that val those values actually can change a little bit depending on what your patient's temperature is. Um, we would send the TEG regardless of our patient's temperature. It has no effect on the values. And so therefore, if we can correct even one of those three things, the more, the better. We're not going to wait for one thing to get corrected, such as hypothermia first, before we move on to the next. It's all uh, interconnected and uh, the sooner we can get a head start on even one of those things, the better. So we would just try to do everything at once, send a tag while it's cooking, try to heat up our patient. Good question. I kind of have a question. Um, this is just me being curious because I'm critical care, but I'm pediatric critical care. Um, and I'm really, I'm really just more out of morbid curiosity because there's like next to no data for TAG in pediatrics, um, except in like heart transplant with ventricular cyst devices and a few other things. I'm curious, like, if you have had experience in the ED, like, do you guys, I notice a lot of times I'll get a patient that comes up here that's like 11 or 10 years old and has a TAG that has been drawn, but like, what do you do you respond to that in the same way with kids? Because usually their coags don't correlate very well with the numbers you get from a tag. Sorry, I muted myself to answer your question, but um, thanks. I, you know, I, I feel like, I, so full disclosure, I'm not a peds nurse and I have no experience with pediatrics, but what I, what I, how I want to answer this is how I feel like my mentors would answer this. So if I could ask this question to Dr. Moore, or Dr. Piracci, I think what I would hear them say is what's the age of the patient? What's their, and how many kilos are they? So, you know, cause, cause some of those 11 year olds that we get, right. They'll, they'll get admitted to the adult uh, surgical ICU and we treat them like adults, even though they may be 11 years old. And, uh, you know, but, but they've got to be pretty big kids in order to do that. Uh, that's the youngest, uh, youngest adult I've taken care of was 11 years old in the ICU. Uh, and, and against my will, my will, trust me. Uh, so over there in the pediatric side, you know, when you guys are like microdosing your PRBCs and all that stuff, I, I really, I don't know. Um, I, I would just tell, I would just say, be careful. You know, um, we certainly don't, wouldn't want to just be hanging, you know, uh, get a cooler of four and two and, uh, you know, push them in with the level one, you know, and uh, do those kinds of things. I, I really can't say for sure about all that stuff, but um, it would be really interesting. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Megan just mentioned Dr. Bensard would be a, a really good person to ask about that. He's our pediatric uh, attending uh, trauma surgeon. Um, he'd be a great person to ask about that. So I, I wish I knew more. I'd be interesting, interested to hear. Next time I see him, I'll definitely ask and um, see if I can pass along the info. Great question, Paul. Any other questions from anybody? I think we're, I think we've got through it. I appreciate, uh, again, everybody's um, attention and time and uh, spending your, your Tuesday evening with me, even on your birthday, Peter. Happy birthday. Uh, really nice to see all of your faces. And um, join us next month for uh, the, next, the next lecture. Thank you. I don't oh, I'm going to hop in. I want to give everyone a little sneak peek. We got uh, three more scheduled right now. There's more in the works, but uh, also if anybody has any ideas of uh, lectures they'd like to see happen or lectures they'd like to teach, uh, please 
come talk to me. I have a uh, jacob.oldefest at dhha.org. Uh, I'll put my email in the thing. But also uh, next month is going to be uh, how to speak to economically disadvantaged children in a medical crisis. Uh, that's going to be done by a social worker for Jefferson County. A uh, month after that, Peter De La Vecchia here in the chat, happy birthday, Peter, is going to do a crisis de-escalation lecture from one of the paramedics. Uh, he also was a hostage negotiator for Longmont, which is super cool. Uh, and then the month after that, we have the HRAC, the Harm Reduction Action Committee, the needle exchange over Ethan Sherman. They're going to teach us everything we'd ever want to know about people who inject drugs. So uh, we've got a exciting series starting. Uh, we hope to see all of you every month. Uh, and again, if you have any ideas or any feedback at all, please come talk to me. Uh, thank you, everybody. We got the title for next month, in case you're ready for it. Oh yeah, give it. It's uh, Don't Be a Menace to Denver While Talking to Kids in the Hood. A, la a lecture on toxic stress. <laughs> Heck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love I love the ones that are a mouthful. Do we have a, a date and time yet for that? Yeah, so that one's gonna be the uh the second Tuesday. Uh, let me like pull up my calendar real quick. So that is gonna be uh August eleventh is the next one. We'll have posters soon. But uh, yeah, August 11th is going to be the next. And it's going to start being, I think, the second Tuesday every month after this one. Awesome. Perfect. Well, thanks for all your work on this, Jacob. Appreciate you uh, getting this rolling with your, with your paramedic crew. I think this will be uh, pretty exciting for everybody from all uh, areas to, to join in on. Thanks, man. And thanks for doing this. And uh, I want to say thanks to Lauren, too, for sticking through this, even though she has probably no background in any of this. No, but I find it like super fascinating. So I'm just glad to um, be able to sit in. You didn't even give her a warning for the arm picture, Tyler. <laughs> Sometimes it's better. It's like, it's like ripping up a Band-Aid. Yeah, thanks for sticking through us with us, Lauren. Yeah, of course. Um, it recorded too, so we can share it um, on our website and everything. So oh, thank perfect. you for putting so much work into this. It was super interesting, even though I um, understood maybe like 25% of the word. It's pretty good. Um, yeah, also, uh, this is done through the DHWU. If you're not a member yet, uh, please join at dhwu.org. Also, uh, we are doing this every month for everybody. If you're friends, students, whoever you want to share this with, uh, this is for the benefit of everyone. So. Please share with all the people you know, and uh, we'll see you all next month, huh? Sounds good. Hey, everybody. Have a good night. Adios, guys.